You can find the Commonwealth Club online at thecommonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the, on the club's YouTube channel. I'm James Taylor, professor of politics at the University of San Francisco, former president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, and your moderator for the program. It is my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest, Juan Williams, political analyst and co-host of, of The Five on Fox News and author of the new book, What the Hell Do You Have to Lose? Trump's War on Civil Rights. Mr. Williams joined Fox News as a contributor in 1997. Prior to that, he served as a senior national correspondent and news analyst at NPR for more than a decade. And before that, he spent 23 years at The Washington Post. During the course of his career, Mr. Williams also received widespread critical acclaim for his series of documentaries, including Politics, The New Black Power, and for his six books, including the nonfiction bestseller, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights, 1954 to 1965. In his new book, Mr. Williams argues that while President Trump considers himself a protector writ for African-American communities around the nation, his words and actions demonstrate otherwise. To discuss the state of civil rights and the country in general, please welcome Mr. Juan Williams. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, the format, you know, you'll be thinking about your questions that you can submit up here to ask Mr. Williams, and I'll just sort of get us started. But I really wanted to just give him an opportunity to sort of just give us a, a, a you know, synopsis of the book from the outset in his own words as to what sort of motivated him and, and what um, all went into play when he thought about this book, the writing of it. Um, and just sort of the whole engagement with this, this text as in, compared to maybe other books that you've written. Uh, Professor Taylor, it's a pleasure to have you with me Thank and you. a pleasure to be here at the Commonwealth Club. Thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. This is a, a tricky subject because race is so weighted in our society for so many centuries, not just in the current uh, look. But the reality is that we are at a critical moment. So normally for me, to answer to, in answer to your question, Professor, I have in, been a tremendously interested in the history of civil rights in the United States, in the, the figures, the people who have been central to promoting social change on the most difficult issue of race. So I've written a biography of Justice Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back at Eyes on the Prize, you can see that I am very interested in people who were change agents in the society. So I'm talking about people like, you know, Cheney Goodman and Schwerner going down south in Freedom Summer, 1964. Who are these people who would put themselves at risk for the greater good, and in that case become martyrs to the cause? But in this moment, I don't think there's much question that if you look at where we are as Americans with regard to race, you'd say, you know, in the words of Charles Dickens, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. In the sense that it's the best of times, you know, in my lifetime, just 10 years ago, we saw the election of a black president, a black man as president of the United States. In my lifetime, we've seen the first black billionaire. We've seen people emerge uh, in terms of the cultural milieu in a way that unimaginable, people from Michael Jackson to Kendrick Lamar. Uh, we've seen people from Denzel Washington to Jennifer Hudson with Academy Awards. Uh, you know, we've seen the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the first Secretary of State, <laughs> African Americans. It, I could keep going in this way. It's really been an incredible period of tremendous gains. And most of all, maybe the gain in terms of the black middle class in this country and the gain in terms of black political power. Right now we have a record number of black people serving in the U.S. Congress, record number of women serving in the U.S. Congress. So we've seen tremendous progress. But at the same time, when you ask people today about the current state of race relations in the country, right now people say that worse race relations are worse than they've ever been. Right now, half of the American people, 49%, say the president is a racist, including 11% of Republicans. So you come to think, well, what has happened? How could it be that we have such tremendous progress 
such tremendous growth in terms of the black middle class, black political voice, black political opportunity, record numbers of graduates from high school and college, and yet people think race relations are going down the tube. I think you and I both know the answer has to do with the rise of Donald Trump. Trump who comes on the political scene with the birther movement saying that the first black president wasn't even an American, that he's an illegitimate president, some kind of Machiavellian candidate. Donald Trump who then comes down the golden escalator at Trump Tower and begins calling Mexicans rapists and criminals. Donald Trump who goes on in terms of the kind of rhetoric that he uses to talk about a black woman as a dog, to talk about NFL players who kneel in protest of police brutality during the anthem as SOBs who should be fired. Uh, Donald Trump who says at one point that a, an American born judge of Mexican parents cannot be fair to him, can't do his job, causing the Speaker of the House, a Republican, Paul Ryan, to say that was the epitome of a racist statement. This is Donald Trump, and he has successfully appealed to white anger and fear in the society, even as the society is becoming more diverse, and especially as we've seen an increase in the number of immigrants. So he has become a force of division, racial division, division in terms of class, in terms of so many uh, points of division in the society, he has been willing to exploit for political advantage. So I'll stop there. But, but at the same time, you, you ground his own orientation in the antecedent party of, of the Republican Party itself, and that you kind of outline the ways in which there are, he's not the first one, and he's sort of not an outlier, maybe in terms of his lack of decorum, but in terms of the substance of his ideas, you put him along a continuum of Republicans. Well, there is a continuum, but what you have to understand is that since the 60s, since the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act, since the passage of the 65 Voting Rights Act, as you know, at that point, President Johnson says, we've lost the South now for a generation. Right. The South went from being mostly Democratic to mostly Republican in the aftermath of those moves. And we know that President Nixon played to a Southern strategy mm -hmm. with just that in mind. We know that someone like President Reagan opened his campaign by going down to Mississippi yes, uh, and going to the Neshoba County Fair, uh, the county where Goodman, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner yeah. were killed. Yeah. Uh, and people had lots of questions. And we know uh, going forward from that, that there have been issues with the Republican Party as becoming more and more white, even as the country became more and more racially diverse. Mm -hmm. But Trump has played this uh, in a way that I think is distinct, Professor, even from other Republicans. I think most Republicans would have no trouble saying, go going back to you know Eisenhower and pushing away uh, so many of the racists of that period, President Eisenhower sending the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, pushing away the John Birch Society, mm -hmm. making it clear uh, the difficulty the party had after 64 and mm -hmm. Goldwater mm -hmm. uh, with racial issues because Goldwater had opposed the Civil Rights Act. Right here in San Francisco, too, <laughs> at the Cow Palace. And what you see is that Republicans viewed being called a racist as just the worst kind of insult and didn't want to put themselves in position uh, to have to bear that burden. Trump has come on the scene and in the name of being not politically correct, not PC, uh, willing to speak uncomfortable truths, started saying things like, what the hell do you have to lose? And I think one of the failures of my own profession journalism has been that people said, oh, this was his appeal to black voters. What the hell do you have to lose? Look at your bad neighborhoods, bad schools, lots of violence, people shooting each other, no jobs. And you have been supporting Democrats, so what the hell do you have to lose? That's the way that comment was reported. I would argue that, in fact, he wasn't speaking to black people. He wasn't going to a black community. He wasn't speaking to a black audience. He was speaking to people in distant suburbs or rural areas overwhelmingly white audiences, 
in contemptuous tones and saying, what's wrong with these people? They can't even see their own best interest. Mm -hmm. And their best interest would be to support me, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And as such, when he said this, it suggested again that Donald Trump saw black people as easily demeaned and it could trigger in the white audience fear, fear of the chaos attendant to, let's say the 20, I think it's 22% of black Americans who live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And he would highlight that and the shootings in Chicago or the kids dropping out of school and say, that is a threat to you in terms of spreading into your communities, you could get mugged or guess what? These people are heavily reliant on social entitlement programs. It's gonna drive up your taxes. Recently, a book came out that talked about the idea that so many people in their analysis of the 2016 election pointed to people feeling forgotten, left behind in white America, especially mm -hmm. outside of the big urban areas. But it said that really the, the key point was that people felt that the undeserving were getting ahead. Right. And the undeserving were right. people of color and the immigrants. Right. And so it's this notion that nobody's helping me. It's these undeserving people mm -hmm. who are the ones getting helped by the government. Yeah. Things like Obamacare or Obama phones, that, that kind of language. Mm -hmm. And Trump plays into this idea. In fact, I would argue he exacerbates this idea if you stop and think about how he makes it the case that immigrants are synonymous with MS-13 right, and that right. somehow the immigrants are here to kill you yeah. and to kill white people. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole notion of the striving, hardworking immigrant living together with a tight family across generations in order to try to achieve the American dream, that's lost. No, they're here to kill you. Yeah. Uh, and so I think he pushes fear buttons on race quite regularly. You make a devastating, I mean, you prosecute, prosecute a devastating case against him. I mean, by the time I got finished the introduction, I'm like, damn, Ron, you, 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 you really, you know, went, went in on him and you don't hold any punches. And having watched you for many years, you aren't inclined to just call somebody racist loosely. So for you to use that language specifically, I think blacks generally don't use race as much as people think they do. Um, loosely, I think they're very careful about when they say someone's racist. I think it has to be a real racist, not in mistreatment. You, you call him this. You literally say he's a racist. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, do you think that the American people takes, take his racism seriously? Well, this is a heart and soul issue for the book and for me. Because as I was saying to you earlier, when you get half of the country saying openly, we think this man's a racist, it's not what Juan Williams thinks, it's what half the country thinks. As I mentioned earlier, it's one out of every 10, more than one out of every 10 Republicans who think he's a racist. Mm -hmm. But implicit in that then is, he was elected by people who said, well, yeah, he's racist, but you know what, that's just not the biggest issue for me. And people who react to him and some of his bullying rhetoric some of his toxic rhetoric, maybe you're being snowflakes and you're overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. That's not really what's going on. Why do you pay so much attention to the words? Mm -hmm. So this book is a really an effort to get beyond the words and professor to get beyond the labels because you're right. I am very reluctant to ever attach a word like racist right. to anyone. And I think that it shuts down conversation. Right. It becomes difficult for people who want to say, well, if you're going to say he's a racist, well, what do we have to talk about? Right. And I find that, by the way, in dealing with whites, that white people are oftentimes very reluctant to say that someone's racist, even if they've seen them commit the most horrific racist act right. because of fear that that charge could easily then be aimed at them. And yeah. they don't want to be called right. a racist. Right. So you have to be very careful with such a heavy word. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing here, I'm just saying, you know what, let's look away from the labels because I don't think it's productive in terms of actual conversation, discourse, mm -hmm. and learning. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, let's look at the policies. Let's look at what he's doing in terms of the administration. The news coverage tends to focus on the rhetoric, the language, some of the attitude that right. he conveys. Right. But you stop for a second and you look at things like 
criminal justice reform in the country, something that Republicans were behind yeah. working with the Obama administration. Yeah. It looked like it had momentum. Yeah. Gone yeah. in the Trump administration. You look at efforts to try to deal with the tensions between poor black communities and the police in terms of consent decrees right. to establish new working relationships. Trump administration comes in, it's gone. Yeah. You look at the presence of programs that are intended to bolster the growth of the black middle class. And here we're talking about programs that would help small business, that would help entrepreneurs, that would help with community development, that would help with financial development in underserved, underprivileged communities, gone under this administration. Mm -hmm. And so at some point you start to think, well, what's happening? And then, of course, in terms of the educational function, mm -hmm. both in terms of uh, elementary and secondary education, where there's a high percentage of underachievers in the black community, and there's tr tremendous need to bolster that. Again, programs put in place by the George W. Bush administration, the Obama administration, now dismantled by Betsy DeVos and the Education Department in this administration. Yeah. And when we think about trying to get more children of color into colleges and universities, again, a tax on this as unfair, keeping somehow white children out of school, and in fact, bringing suits arguing that Asian children are the ones being discriminated right. against. But I think it's a beard to try to undo all affirmative action because of discontent over the idea that we're making an effort. So in the book, in What the Hell Do You Have to Lose, I tell the story of James Meredith mm -hmm. and what it took to get this young man, this Air Force veteran, into the University of Mississippi, mm -hmm. the sacrifices that had to be made. I remind people about what happened with Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas, trying to block nine children from attending Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And you say, well, wait a second, this is a tremendous effort over generations to try to repair the damage of legal segregation in American society. But Trump comes to it and says, no, that's not the issue, and dismantles so much of what has been helping to heal the racial divide in this country. Mm -hmm. And he delights and benefits by saying that he is speaking the truth but the truth he speaks, of course, is of division and, uh, and increased racial tension. So given his personal racism and, for example, the personal racism of LBJ, um, LBJ was very conservative at one point. You know better than I do. Um, once he's in, just like Earl Warren, things change. He becomes the most, I would argue, even more than Lincoln, the most you know, black-friendly president in American history in terms of policy. Can Donald Trump's personal racism be put to use for black political outcomes in the way you'd like to see. I, I'm not quite in, in other words, if LBJ was a racist and he did more for blacks than any other president in American history, I don't, I why don't, can't Donald Trump? I think that, I think, well, you, I don't You, know. you LBJ, don't accept the premise. Yeah, because I think LBJ came from Texas, came out of that Dixiecrat whole attitude and tradition, uh, but he is someone who, who had worked, I think he was a school teacher, in fact, right. with... Uh, Mexican children down in border communities. He had a sense of that, and I think he had a sense of w feeling as if he could be larger than life. He yeah. could be a liberator yeah. in the in the Lincoln yeah. tradition. And, and Barry Goldwater was that way too. I think. Well, he beat Goldwater, remember, and he he pilloried Goldwater for his racial attitudes around the Civil Rights Act. Okay. So that's why I resist the premise okay. of your question. Okay. Um, but, so go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, so this. Question is, do you find it difficult to talk about race relations while Trump is in office while you're working on Fox News? <laughs> well, I can tell you, I, I, I think if this was a, a different kind of audience, I'd rip off my shirt and show you, <laughs> show you the scars, you know? Uh, because it's so difficult to have meaningful conversations about race, especially with my colleagues at Fox. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good thing about Fox is that I'm there. Right. They're the number one cable channel in America. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity, I think, to pierce the bubble and to say, hey, there's a different perspective and a different experience of life. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. to, to me, I'm in the arena on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And so the attitudes and the questions that I have to cope with and the kind of onslaught, because I'm the exception, not part of the mainstream. Right. 
uh, it can be heavy. But you said it's a different thing. reaction. When you're in studio, there's one phenomena that happens to you, but when you go out the door, there's a whole other reality in terms of how people perceive you ideologically, I think it is you were saying. Um, that you were saying that sort of when you're out of the studio, that oh, you mean you're like a representative of a sort of liberal left perspective in, 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 in studio, if I'm not mistaken. Well, no, you said I, that, I mean, obviously, if I'm talking to Sean Hannity, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not that kind of, he's right. conservative. They right. say, well, so you must be the liberal because he's the conservative, right? right? right, right, right. But I'm, it's like that. I just give you that as an extreme example. But I mean, what you, you know, in my life, I think people have often tried to pigeonhole me. Are right. you left? Right. Are you right? right. You know, how, where do you fit in yeah. this? And that was my question too. And in, and in so many areas, you know, it just becomes a, a question because I'll say, you know what? I think there are policies that have not been productive. I think we need to, for example, I wrote a book called Enough, mm -hmm. which was about the failures of black leadership in this time. You know, black leadership not going after critical issues like why do we have uh, communities bedeviled by drug dealers? Right. Why aren't we aren't there protesting right. the drug dealers? Right. Uh, why aren't we going after the problem of poor quality schools? Right. Why aren't we more aggressive in saying these schools are not serving our community's best interest as opposed to seeing them as simply providing jobs again, mm -hmm. oftentimes in the black community, but failing the black children. And I think it's, that's short-term, mm -hmm. uh, short-sighted thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, so on so many levels, I'm willing to question the leadership. And then people say, well, that means you must be conservative. No, I'm just trying to tell you, I think we have to hold political leaders to account, black, white, Asian, Latino, if they're not serving the community, call them out. But again, that's more outside the studio. But can I, if can, can in, I, at the studio where I work for Fox, right. I am positioned and, and posturing there as the left. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, this, so this question is related. It says, I love you on the five, but how do you prepare for the antics, put downs and non sequiturs of Jesse Waters? And I've uh, and I fast forward through most of what he says. Is he um, a role, uh, is he playing a role or is he just an immature, resentful person? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope Jesse will have a chance to come speak to this audience. I they're very interested. No, I, th I think, again, Jesse represents a point of view and finds that for him, there are people who are big supporters and people who find his, uh, his kind of presentation entertaining. Mm -hmm. It becomes entertainment. But I think it's entertainment that sometimes is at a cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, to perceptions of common destiny and common interest and common commonality as Americans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Related question. Mr. Williams, how do you maintain your civility working with your colleagues at Fox News who consistently support and echo actions and words of such despicable and illegitimate, of, of, an, of, of a despicable and illegitimate president? <laughs> well, again, I have to cope with the idea that so many of my colleagues are, in fact, on the Trump bandwagon. Uh, and I'm willing to challenge it and to speak out against it. And again, my hat's off to the idea that I'm there mm -hmm. and the audience for the most part likes me. So that's a, you know, that, that's a, a shock in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next question. Do you, please, please do, please. Uh, do you think African-Americans should join with Latinos or Hispanics, et cetera, to be a bigger voting bloc? And how do you get participation significantly higher? Well, I think that what you have to do is make it seem urgent. Mm -hmm. uh, and people have to see that it directly impacts their lives. Now, we're coming up on these midterm elections, and historically, minority communities, educated people, and Democrats do not turn out in high numbers. Mm -hmm. But I think that because this has become something of a referendum on Trump, and because of Trump's behavior, including a lot of his racist behavior, right. I think there is a sense of urgency, and I think you're going to see a larger turnout in the midterms as a consequence. So this is all about your life, my life, our communities, our families. Mm -hmm. And when people feel that politics makes a difference, mm -hmm. I think you see them become activated. Too often they felt, you know what, it doesn't make a difference, that you know, the Democrats might take you for granted mm -hmm. uh, and the Republicans might ignore you. Mm -hmm. But what we have now is a situation where people feel that they are being demonized mm -hmm. and belittled. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and hopefully that does create a common set of issues that drive them to the polls. You write with a sen sense of urgency, and that was a question I was going to ask you. you. This book is written with a sense of urgency. And, I, you know, I've been around, you know, the last 30, 40 years listening to people talk about this concept of race war, and nobody takes it, has ever taken it seriously. But when you see Bannon out in Italy, um, Steve Miller in the, in the White House, um, do you take the concept of race war seriously at all? I don't know what, what you mean. This whole idea war. that there was this projection, I think it was Coase, that wrote, C O S E, that had written a book called The Coming Race War. This whole idea that oh. race war is coming. And with the president sort of, you know, fanning the flames that you're saying he's, he's uh, fanning, do you f take that concept that the, we are going to balkanize as a society with these racial divisions in terms of violence? Uh, no, I don't think that's coming. I think that you have episodes where there's racial violence in the country and people act out. Uh, it can be somebody, uh, you know, in terms of we see it with all too frequent uh, regular with all too much regularity of you know the police shooting somebody and saying why did you shoot etc and fear of black men and all mm -hmm. the rest coming mm -hmm. to the forefront but no I think the the nation is on a different track professor which is that we're becoming more diverse mm -hmm. uh, and in my lifetime uh, you know I like in the book I say you know Trump is 72 I'm 64 mm -hmm. you know eight years different but we've lived through this tremendous change in America but he seems to have missed what yeah. I saw happen. Right, right, right. And the growth in the black middle class, for example, to me, is the most important thing that's happened in my lifetime. Right, right. right? right. I mean, to compare my life and my father's, I say in the book right. that if, you know, my father, you know, lived in, in, his life was defined by his race in terms of where he lived, his neighborhood, in terms of his jobs, right? But for me, uh, you know, if he saw me living in an integrated neighborhood, if he said, you know what, you work and have contracts with major American media, white-owned media, mm -hmm. you write books for white publishers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if he saw that his granddaughter, my daughter, mm -hmm. was a graduate of Georgetown University Law School, a nice. school that didn't accept black people right. until the late 60s, right. He'd say, that's a different world. Right. And if he saw me at the White House having lunch and then saw that the other guy sitting there was a black man and then realized that's <laughs> President Obama, <laughs> he'd say, oh, my God, that's a different universe. Right. I can't imagine that, right. my dad would say, right? right? So you stop and think about these things that have happened in our lifetime, but also in Trump's lifetime. Mm -hmm. You say, what an amazing thing. 40% of black America earning between thirty-five dollars and $100,000, an additional 12% earning between $100,000 and $200,000, that means more than half of black America is either on the edge of being middle class or solidly in it and beyond it. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't plug into that notion of people have sacrificed, people have been in the vineyards working hard to allow this to occur. Mm -hmm. Instead, he focuses, I think, quite intentionally on the dysfunction, the chaos in poor black communities and uses that to stir fear and division in the white community. But to your point, remember, it's the case that blacks are about 13% of the population. Mm -hmm. One of the, another big change in my lifetime has been that Latinos are now a larger group than right, blacks. Right, right. 16 to 17% of the population. Asians, the fastest growing segment of that minority yeah. population, 7 to 8%. So you start to see that the country is on track to become more diverse, more of a multicultural experience in the United States. And what Trump is doing, I think, like with the Make America Great Again hats, he's hearkening back to yeah. a time yeah. when there was a very, the whole notion of, well, blacks were happy to be, to live in segregated, right. lesser lives, right? Women were happy to remain in their place. And nobody was going to complain. That's, that's his America. Right. And sometimes I think the 1940s, if not the 1950s. Right, right. Um, but that's not where we're going. Yeah. This is, to me, almost like a spasm, like a reaction from okay. people who say the change is coming too fast. I'm not comfortable. And it's so easy to define the other as responsible for whatever difficulties are occurring, especially in these difficult economic times when you have greater income inequality right. in the country. Right. 
and when you have segments of the country being left behind. Uh, I had a piece in the Chronicle this past weekend in which I talk about how Trump says, oh, anytime he's charged with anything racist, he says, well, look at the black unemployment rate. It's low at a historic low rate. He doesn't mention that it's overwhelming, like that 90% of this reduction occurred under President Obama. Right. <laughs> um, but he, does, he, he then goes on and says, you know, what do you complain about? You know, it's just like, but in fact, in fact, what you see is that where we have economic growth at the moment are in industries like coal mining, mm -hmm. manufacturing, oil. Mm -hmm. He is helping dying economies, basically, mm -hmm. and in mostly in small towns and rural areas, not where the concentrations of minorities are in the country, right. and not in industries that are growing. So we're not in industries like tech. Not, we're, now we're not talking about retail. We're not talking about education. Yeah. We're not talking about public service, yeah. even government, and the need for government programs. So to me, again, he is a guy who is hearkening to the past, mm -hmm. to America's past, I, and part of that is a very racist I, I think on page 26, you, you, you basically use the phrase that I've used on this very platform trying to explain to people what I thought Trump represented, but you are the first person I've seen in writing who says it. You say that Trump represents a kind of U-turn, a reversal. To what extent? Is he going to have a, 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 an apartheid effect where, where we end up in an apartheid after Trump? Or, in other words, I see two competing Americas present in Obama as a possibility and Trump as a possibility in short order. And this, this is not the first time we've been like this. We, we were like this with Nixon and LBJ, right, back to back. Uh, do you, how do you foresee how this plays out in terms of whether we go the multi-America multi way with Obama and what that represents from the young and the diversity or the kind of backlash that we see in Bannon and Trump and others? Well, I, again, I don't see it in those. In, I don't see that dichotomy okay. because, in my mind, I think that what you have is Obama speaking to your hopes, you know, and to your aspirations, almost to your dreams for what America could be mm -hmm. uh, in terms of brotherhood, in terms of opportunity, in terms of growth, mm -hmm. uh, the beacon that we are to the world in terms of democracy and economic growth. Mm -hmm. But I think Trump speaks to our fears mm -hmm. and specifically to racial fears and to animosity and anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And so he plays on these yeah. hidden anxieties in a very, very uh, pernicious way. Yeah. Uh, so when you ask me, do I see us growing in one way or another? To my mind, the country is so dynamic. I think it's growing and changing. Yeah almost beyond yeah. his ability to control it. But he can play in terms of our politics to those fears, and he has no problem pushing that fear button regularly. Mm -hmm. Is there any way in your mind as a student of politics that Trump can somehow hurt the institution itself permanently? The institution? The institution of the presidency. Oh, Has I he hurt it permanently? Oh, certainly. I mean, I think he's, for example, the events of today, I think, hurt the institution of the Supreme Court gravely. Uh, the whole notion of trusting that the law is impartial, that, you know, lady justice is blind, um, that it's not the case that you're simply uh, assuming that fi the five Republicans will vote one way and the four Democrats mm -hmm. on the court. That, I mean, that, that to me is, you know, we see so much lack of trust in major American institutions now. And I think that Trump's behavior, his lack of civility, uh, the way that he injects himself into every controversy. Uh, he sees it as beneficial to himself, to his political agenda, but I think it lowers the standing of the presidency in the American mind mm -hmm. as to what the presidency uh, represents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I mean, this is going to sound a little bit naive, but I think that, especially for children, mm -hmm. that the whole notion that People who rise to the top in American society are learned people, disciplined people, people uh, with some sense of how to relate to others in an effective way. Mm -hmm. I think all of that goes away because they say, hey, look, Donald Trump's president. The schoolyard bully can be the president. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Yeah. So these are questions kind of related to the, 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 the proceedings today. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, what would... 
If you were at today's uh, proceedings, what would you have asked Professor Ford and Judge Kavanaugh? What would you have asked her or him? I'm not equipped to answer that, but I think that, uh, you know, the whole way that that setting, uh, the whole, the way that it was set up to me was not effective mm -hmm. uh, and did not allow for, to me, anything to be determined other than, again, to rivet uh, pre-existing opinions mm -hmm. in place. And I don't think that's healthy. Um, you know, there was the opportunity to have an FBI review mm -hmm. as an extension of the background check on the judge. Mm -hmm. There was an opportunity to have other people come in uh, who were there or had some experience during those high school years. Mm -hmm. That was not done. So I think it was not done in a way that, was, that would have allowed us to come to some re reasoned conclusion about what might have taken place and what didn't take place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, again, we talked about diminished trust in the in major American institutions. Boy, yeah. to see what happened yeah. there with that Senate Judiciary Committee yeah. is tragic. Yeah, and I think a lot of people underestimate the way in which globally, but especially here after Watergate, Americans' opinions about the major institutions, the three branches of government, went, went south and never fully recovered. And it wasn't just in the U.S., it was all over the world, but it happened here too. So this may be a continuation of it. So that's well, I mean, when you see the world laughing at a U.S. president, as we saw at the United Nations this week, it's just, it's very sad, and, and I'll tell you, so I've been traveling around mm -hmm. promoting the book, and one of the experiences I've had is that people who are left-leaning will say to me, hey, did you see what happened, you know, the U.N. General Assembly laughing at the president's claim that he's done more than any other president, and Republicans never even knowing that this occurred. It's as if they're in two separate spheres mm -hmm. with regard to information that they get in their worlds. Mm -hmm. And they don't, one group doesn't know something happened, the other group thinks something major and significant yeah. has taken place. Yeah, yeah. Next question is, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, some white uh, Obama voters switched to Trump. Why? And how can they be reversed or recovered? Oh, well, I think that what you have is a situation where you had Hillary Clinton as a candidate, and I think lots of people in that, in those, particularly those Rust Belt states that you identified, didn't relate to her, uh, didn't see her as concerned for them. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's part of the equation. Mm -hmm. There is this group that went for Obama and then went for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I think in both cases, they speak to a desire for disruption in the government, for something that's gonna cause change something that's going to make their lives better. Um, and in Trump, I think there was more of the kind of populist surge. With Obama, it was more hope and change, mm -hmm. as I was suggesting to you earlier. Mm -hmm. But the populist urge in terms of Trump, then, of course, then it invited the idea that there's someone to blame. Ironically, he is a New York billionaire, he says, right? <laughs> right? And it, you would think that the populist right. in the country would not relate to that figure, given what happened in 08 and the Great Recession right. and the whole notion that Wall Street gets <clears throat> bailed out, too big to fail, but Main Street yeah. and the working man did not get bailed out. Yeah. Um, that kind of goes back to LBJ's comment about the, the poorest white man, if you can you know, persuade him to, you know, that he's, that the Negro is doing better than him, he'll open up his pockets to let himself be robbed by others? Well, I think it, it's more like Dr. King's statement that there are certain politicians, white segregationists, who were feeding them the bread of hate, mm -hmm. that that was what they could say to themselves, that they're better than those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question. It is increasingly difficult for you, well, this is, again, a number of Fox questions, so uh, there's a bunch here. Um, it is increasingly difficult for you to justify your continued association with Fox, given how that network programming has evolved. I guess somebody wants you to comment on that. Oh. Well, here's another question. Please explain how Fox News, your affiliation, supports or denies the plea for racial harmony, your original thoughts about solutions. So I guess people want to know about you and, and your relationship to Fox, because it's here in many different forms. Well, as I said earlier, to me, I think that Fox, as such a major platform in American media, the number one cable news station in the country, uh, is an important venue to have somebody come in and b burst the bubble, uh, have someone come in and offer 
a different set of perspectives and facts. Mm -hmm. So I find myself challenging so many of their top personalities, mm -hmm. and I, I'm there every day, mm -hmm. uh, and no one is telling me what to say. So to me, this is an opportunity. It comes at a tremendous cost because I feel beat up mm -hmm. much of the time, right. and I feel like, <laughs> oh my God, you're not hearing me. Right. But it's not the case that I am not, in fact, saying what I want to say mm -hmm. and trying to reach. And it's very interesting uh, to pick up on a point I, meant, I, I mentioned in passing earlier, mm -hmm. that there's so much oftentimes positive response from people that people will say to me at a ball game in the airport and the trains, whatever, they will say to me, you know, I don't agree with your politics, but I like you and I like the fact that you're there. You know, when I go to the water fountain and I run into people, it's not that I haven't heard the other side of the argument. And so I'm performing a function there as a foil, but I think also as a uh, source mm -hmm. of a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a kind of a funny one. It says, you used to be 6'4". You take such a pounding every night on the five. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, there's a, what would you have, again, that was a, the repeated one. Do you think former President Obama was a, po was a net positive or, or for race relations? He famously believes he was 10 to 20 years too early, Obama. Well, do you think Obama was a net positive for race relations? Oh, I do. Uh, I think, you know, looking back on the Obama presidency, boy, you know, I see people in T-shirts that simply say, do you miss me now? And I think that's, <laughs> that's very real. What a contrast in terms of, uh, you know, a class act, lack of scandal yeah. and all the rest. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine if President Obama had been involved with a porn star, had been, you know, paying off people, lying, if his first national security advisor uh, had pled guilty, his campaign manager, I think, I think he would be long be gone. Yeah. I think he would not, he'd, he would- Well, his nominee had the scandal that we see, we're watching I just, today. I just don't think there's any point of comparison. Well, this question is related to that. This is obviously political pressure and negative media attention don't change Trump's mind or behavior. So what will? Do you think he will win a second term? What will change Trump and will he win again? Okay, I think they're two separate issues. Mm -hmm. One is I don't think there's any changing this 72-year-old man mm -hmm. uh, who tells people he's a stable genius. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I leave it alone. And, you know, I don't think I, I don't. I think we've gone past that point. They say you can only change people when they're in diapers, and I think that definitely applies to Trump. Mm -hmm. um, as to whether he might win re-election, well, his numbers are just terrible even now. Um, and they creep up at times. And there was some good news for the Republicans this week in terms of approval of the party was, I think, at 47, just right, slightly above Democrats at 46 mm -hmm. in one Gallup poll. But if you look at, for example, uh, generic party preference when it comes to this election, Democrats haven't been able to pull away, but they still maintain a strong uh, margin advantage. And when it comes to engagement and energy among the voting base, Democrats really have a strong advantage going into these midterms. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the 2020 race, I think it'll have to do with who the Democrats are able to nominate and exactly how you engage Trump, because I think that's very difficult, as we saw in the Republican primaries. If you try to say, hey, this guy knows very little, this guy you know, as someone who says outrageous things, calls people names, et cetera, uh, it's not, not necessarily effective with his base. So his base is likely to nominate him again. I don't know if John Kasich or whoever on the Republican side might hold out and yeah. challenge him, and I think that's possible, but I don't see that person prevailing. Yeah. But once it comes to a general election, I think if the Democrats have someone who's able to not only take on Trump, but to contrast, offer a contrast in terms of political stability mm -hmm. and political experience to Trump, mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think Trump's in big trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, that's, that's, I think that's news. Um, yeah. What is your perspective on rising, you said, uh, spoke a little bit about it, but what is your perspective on rising socioeconomic inequality, increased housing, education, healthcare costs? and its impact on the future of minority middle class groups. Your opinion, on, and also they want to know, how, related to that, how you feel about Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Well, I think that, let's 
deal with the first part and the rise in income inequality and how it impacts minorities in the country. Remember, as I was saying to you earlier, you have, for the first time in American society, a sizable black middle class. This, to me, is a tremendous achievement. I think there are two major achievements of the civil rights movement. One is that economic stability, but secondly would be political voice. Mm -hmm. Um, and we touched on that with, right. o with Obama, but also a record number of blacks in Congress right. and the like, black mayors. Uh, right now you have the possibility of a black governor uh, in Florida, in Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, Maryland. Right? Yeah. These are amazing things. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, this is, again, part of the growth, and I think, you know, I don't see how you hold back that wave of change that's sweeping America. Yeah, it's almost like Trump is happening up here, but there's something else going on with women and with minorities electorally uh, across the country. Well, I open think seats. I wouldn't, I wouldn't exclude whites. I think educated right. whites. I think people, you know, and, and after the failure of the Trump tax cuts, yeah. I think there are people who are working class whites who say, you know, I don't, I don't see it. I don't know what's going on. Again, I, that plays into mm -hmm. what's going on in the midterms. Mm -hmm. But you asked about how this impacts then the black middle class. Right. Well, I think that in, if you look at it, the question is how, I think the question that would come from the black community to any president is what are you doing to help that black middle class grow and in particular, in particular to overcome the wealth gap so that even as you have a stronger black middle class than ever before, there remains a tremendous differential in terms of wealth, in terms of people buying houses, stocks, dividends, property, investments that attends, uh, attaches to the white community and is absent in the black community. So it's more of the kind of paycheck to paycheck and people coming along slowly. That is the big difference. And what I, again, to reiterate, Trump is taking away some of those government supports mm -hmm. that were put in place to encourage entrepreneurship, to encourage uh, the growth of that black middle class. One other point on this is when Trump comes in and says he's going to drain the swamp, he starts cutting at government. Remember, Bush comes in, Obama comes in, and they are repositioning, reforming government, but at the same time, you see small increments in government. For minorities, disproportionate share of minorities working for government, state, local, but also federal government. I think it's like 33% more of a likelihood for minorities mm. because of bias in the private sector, difficulties in private sector employment. Mm -hmm. So when he's whacking at this, when he's freezing payments for government workers, when he's taking away tax base from local and state government, he is impacting that black and Latino mm -hmm. middle class mm -hmm. in a very real way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is another question. During the Clarence Thomas conference. Oh, I forgot one thing was about Bernie Sanders. Yeah, how do you feel about Bernie? <laughs> Thank you. And again, I think Sanders, it's so interesting, there's a real commonality if you look at the numbers between so many Trump voters and Sanders voters. They are populist, yeah. and they want something of a disruption in terms of American politics. Um, but again, the difference is that for the Sanders voters, they see government as having a role, and they do not believe that simply by giving more to the rich that you are going to solve these problems. This is like Elizabeth Warren and the Consumer Financial mm -hmm. Protection Board. Mm -hmm. You know. Trump comes in and he wants to do away with that. And the argument that he would make is this is over-regulation, burdensome on business. Warren and Sanders make the case, no, what we see is big business, in fact, exploiting, mm -hmm. taking advantage of people who are hardworking mm -hmm. Americans mm -hmm. of all colors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where the divide comes between the Sanders and the Trump uh, voting base. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake about it, there's populist energy that I think is rebelling against the idea of the establishment and especially the upper income establishment as looking out for themselves and their children at the expense yeah. of the rest of the country. Yeah. No, well said. So we have like 15 minutes left and I have to get through all of these, so I'm going to try my best to be as quick as I can. Clarence Thomas uh, hearings. Uh, you reportedly supported Thomas's position that he was a victim of a high-tech lynching. Today, Lindsey Graham spoke about Brett Kavanaugh in a, as a victim. Do you think Kavanaugh is a victim of a conspiracy to smear him? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, this is related to the, you, you've already answered that the, the question. Uh, to, oh, 
um, that's inappropriate. Uh, the black community, and especially <laughs> black women, the black community often, off, yeah, sometimes you have to use your discretion as a person reading these things. Uh, the black community, and especially black women, often make the difference in elections, like in Alabama with Roy Moore. Why, underline, don't parties do more to support their candidates? Or aren't they now? Are, are, isn't that the case that Democrats kind of are supporting minority and women candidates more. So oh, I, I, I got so confused because I thought you were saying it had to do with black women or something. But no, they're no. talking about how black people, black women have performed electorally since Hillary and down in Alabama. Or do you mean in terms of can, as candidates or as voters? As voters. As and then voters. the question is how come they're not trying to mentor and nurture those people to become more can, you know, candidates? Well, I think this is, I mean, everybody calls this the year of the woman. Yeah, big time. Uh, and you see it not only in terms of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez right. in New York, yeah. Ayanna yeah. Presley That's up right. in Boston, right. and of course, uh, you look at what's going on uh, here in San Francisco, London Bree. <laughs> yeah, but you look at look at Georgia, <laughs> right? Georgia. Right, right. Um, can you talk about gerrymandering as well as uh, restoring rights to felons who have served their time? Both disproportionately hurt African Americans. Gerrymandering and vo and voter restoration. Well, I think with gerrymandering, it's all about retention of power. So one of the things, again, people get locked into Trump's rhetoric or what he said and, you know, oh, can you believe he calls Omarosa a dog and that kind of thing. Um, but again, you look at, he comes into office, he says, oh, Hillary Clinton really didn't win the popular vote. Right. I won the popular vote, but there was so much... Yeah. Illegal and fraudulent and you talk voting about that in the taking on, place on elections, uh, and and then he goes about creating a voter fraud commission. And he appoints Chris Kobach, the attorney general in Kansas, uh, to this. And they search and they search for voter fraud. It's non-existent. Mm -hmm. They can't find significant voter fraud in the country, mm -hmm. uh, and then they disband the commission. But nonetheless, there are Republican majority state legislatures that are going about closing polling places, mm -hmm. diminishing hours for voting in the country, yeah, right? You show how it takes Making all it over. more difficult to get identification so that you can properly vote in the country. And I think that's going on in a way that to me that is criminal. Yeah. And then part of that is, of course, the gerrymandering, which is that you say to the minority communities, okay, you can have your elected official, but we're gonna then carve out additional spaces that exclude you so that we can retain the majority. Uh, to me, one of the most troubling aspects, Professor, is that right now, it's 18% of the country represented by the Republican majority in the US Senate. 18%, mm -hmm. that means 82% of the country is not represented by the majority of the US Senate. Mm -hmm. 82%. Mm -hmm. To me, this is tyranny. Mm -hmm. You have a small group, and you know, if you get into the House and the Freedom Caucus, and they have their own set of rules, they refuse to even do business with the majority, with the, with the Democrats, on the basis that unless a majority of the Republicans support the initiative, we won't put it forward. It will never come mm -hmm. to the floor for a vote. Mm -hmm. So what you see, I think, is a distortion of the political process a distortion of democracy itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question. How do you feel about Kanye West, uh, his support for both Trump and Kaepernick um, of, and the March for Our Lives? Does his voice uh, as a public figure matter, Kanye's? I think he's disturbed. Uh, and I think, I think, I don't, I, don't, I don't say that with any delight. I think that he really has issues, I mean, of his own, of his own admission. But to me, his own explanation uh, is quite interesting. He said, you know, that he couldn't get time with Obama, but he can get us an audience with Trump, and he likes to think of himself as someone who is just going on gut and just trying to be different. And so he resists the idea that most black people are opposed to Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. So he sees himself as distinguished in his kind of you know, strange right, right, support. Right, right, right. But I don't think that it's based on anything to do with policy. I don't think it's based on anything to do with endorsing his kind of rhetoric. And I would say the other day, Snoop Dogg came out and just, <laughs> just blasted him for right. this kind of thing. So right. in, that, 
you know, hip hop right. rap community. I, I think that he's isolated there again. But he, in fact, he may see that then as justifying in himself as the outsider. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with substance. Yeah. This is kind of related. Um, MLK Jr., because in your book, you, you come out swinging on ta Coates and you make some points about Black Lives Matter in the campaign where they confront John Lewis and Hillary Clinton. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., Black Lives Matter, Colin Kaepernick, again, which happens here first in San Francisco, have all been criticized for the way in which they protest. Do you think there's an acceptable means of protest, protesting for black Americans? Given your work. <laughs> <laughs> There's never been. Yeah. Uh, you go back to the civil rights days. I mean, you know, letter from a Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King is a response to white ministers in Birmingham saying, you know, give us time. We don't need you to come down here and stir up trouble. Uh, and we don't need you to antagonize the business community in terms of protest against segregation in, mm -hmm. in the uh, restaurants and the department stores. Mm -hmm. And there's King in jail writing in the margins of a newspaper, the only stationery he had available, making it very clear that what for you is inconvenient and seems as if it's being stirred up is in fact an ongoing crisis mm -hmm. for me, my community, my family. Mm -hmm. And that people have been waiting going back to the 1700s mm -hmm. for change in this mm -hmm. country. But now, you, you do have criticisms of some of the tactics, though, that, that Black Lives Matter, for example, has used oh. when it confronted Hillary and Bernie? Well, I think that I would have, you know, for my money, I thought Kaepernick opened the door, for example, to the critics by kneeling during the anthem. I think, boy, I so appreciate the idea that athletes with major profiles and platforms can bring attention to problems in a community that is, under, un, I think, underserved in terms of attention to police brutality. Um, but again, you open the door when you say something to do with patriotism, making you out to be less American or less respectful of the flag. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, you don't drop your, your hand and don't think your opponent's going to hit mm -hmm. you. So you could see that one coming, and I just thought, you know, that, that was easily avoided. Mm -hmm. But it's worked, I think, to his advantage and to the advantage of drawing attention and I think the Black Lives Matter movement has had tremendous success on that level of mm -hmm. raising consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think that there are ways that are effective to do protest. But you know what? I, I think it was Frederick Douglass who said that you never have the ocean without the roar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're never going to have, you know, thunder without the yeah, lightning. Right. So things are not always going to be just the way that you want. And sometimes people have to stir and provoke change in ways that are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question says, I believe that, we, that our only remedy, both underlined, for racism in our country will come when white people, quote unquote, uh, I can't read this next word, but it says, and everyone else um, is more something, and then everyone else makes personal, individual changes. Please comment. I believe that we, I believe that, again, our, uh, that our only remedy to racism is uh, in our country will come when white people sort of stand up, I guess I'll substitute the word, and everyone else makes personal and individual changes. So kind of the personal responsibility uh, piece for the black community, but the racism piece for the white community. And I guess I want you to comment. Well, I think personal responsibility is so important. And I've written about this repeatedly. I think that's why sometimes when people try to pigeonhole right. they'd say, oh, well, you're, you must be a conservative. But I say, no, well, you know, to me, going back to some of the books that I've written, I say there are real steps that people can take to avoid poverty, to build themselves and build the next generation yeah. of their community. Yeah. Um, and I think that civil rights leaders, it's incumbent on them to spread that word, to not simply be about the worst problems or saying white people have some responsibility and why aren't whites doing more? Why isn't the government doing more? I think there's the opportunity to say, why aren't we doing more to help ourselves, yeah. right? And you say, and we can't wait for the government to come. I don't think you should wait because yeah. guess what? The government doesn't yeah. come in many yeah. cases, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think you have to take some, again, personal responsibility. People, though, are quick to sort of draw a diagram, if you will, and say, well, if you are promoting personal responsibility, you must be avoiding the reality of systemic racism and discrimination in the society. I don't think it's an either or 
uh, sort of pattern. Mm -hmm. I think it's a pattern in which you say government has a role to play mm -hmm. in terms of especially those who have been left behind, mm -hmm. people who have not been able to gain the education, gain the experiences that would allow them to benefit from changes in American society, mm -hmm. the, op the doors that have opened. But I don't think that once those doors open, you should still be pointing at government and the like. You should, in fact, exercise great care. I, I worry you know, tremendously about high rate of out of wedlock birth in the black community, about what it does in terms of modeling for children and the like, and experience. I think it drives down. We talked about the growth of the black middle class. Well, guess what? One of the key links to poverty is single parent women. Yeah. Right, because they're working on their own. They're trying to raise a child. They're trying to. It's just very yeah. difficult. Yeah. And again, we can speak about the benefits of two-parent families, of family structure. Um, and, and that's and consistent. I mean, it. and you, you're as a, a great student of history. That's consistent with. And I was sort of laughing when I was reading it because I was like, man, Juan Williams here sounds kind of like a nationalist in this space where he's saying we need to do for ourselves. We need to, you know, community needs to sort of look in, inward and focus on itself. So I'm like, I know that's not his intention, but in terms of your, you know, position, we can go to Garvey. We can find it in church every Sunday morning. I think so. I think that's I what don't... people got upset about Rita Franklin's funeral was they got a window into what happens every Sunday morning when the church is in, in flow. Right. Well, see, I, I think that people are quick and I think it's cheap. They come, not only do they want to pigeonhole me, I think they want to be able to label in a way that would say, well, this is exactly who this person is. But I think that if they think for themselves, if they look at the realities that we are experiencing in America today, uh, you would see that we need to be somewhat flexible and ready in our thought process to change mm -hmm. uh, and to adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, four minutes, several questions. Uh, there will be a book signing. Uh, it will be in the back, isn't it? Right, right here in the back, Mr. Williams will meet you. So if you buy your copy of the book, he'll be glad to sit back there with you and uh, sign it. Uh, these are some hopeful uh, questions. One is, how do you look for, uh, who do you look to for hope? Public figures, activists, and related. How do you remember that we, how do we remember that we are more united than separated? Hope, and how do we remember that we're more united than separated? Well, I, I, I tend not to deify public figures. I tend to, you know, I, I, I look at people who are in my life or who I know and people who are promoting change, people who are bringing things along, I think, in some significant way. As I said uh, earlier, you know, to me, it's amazing that we have people, you know, everybody from Oprah to Brian Stevenson, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you have people who are doing different things in different spheres, but helping to raise our consciousness, helping to raise... Uh, the society as a whole and make us a better country. Mm -hmm. President Obama, I think, again, was a class act. Uh, to me, someone who really helped to raise the American, uh, raise America up. So it, I don't tend to deify people in that sense, but I would like to acknowledge people, uh, you know, who are making a difference. Mm -hmm. People who are in their communities, a community activists, if you will, but also people who are in the business community. The other day, I was at the Ali Center in Louisville for, mm -hmm. for an award ceremony, and there was a young woman there, uh, and she said I had spoken at her, high, um, her college graduation uh, back in 2010, and she was getting an award. Why was she getting an award? She had been in the Peace Corps in Africa uh, and discovered that there was some plants that people really weren't farming or growing but were tremendously nutritious mm -hmm. um, and decided, you know what, why don't we start more of the farming of this crop and then why don't we see if we can market this crop in terms of powders and health uh, potions and the like, and now selling it here in terms of health bars and smoothies and the like. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how people are so critical of capitalism, but she said in her mind, what she had learned since leaving school was that capitalism is bigger than geographic boundaries, mm -hmm. bigger than religion, bigger than racial divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's everywhere in the world. And if you can turn it from just pure naked profit into stakeholders, mm -hmm. and so that the people on the ground who be can then become farmers, people who can become involved in marketing and shipping, in selling and retailing it, if everybody is profiting, everybody is lifted up under that structure, I thought, wow, what an amazing mm -hmm. young woman. Mm -hmm. To me, that's an inspiring soul. That's the kind of person I, th I look up to and I take energy and inspiration mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. 
this book uh, it was endorsed by Dr. Uh, uh, Clarence Jones, who was at our university. Uh, the letters were in orange. That jumped out at me. That was obvious. But I just want to commend you on doing a great job in this book because you just interweave so much of the history that you've you outlined originally in the eyes of the prize with the contemporary issue. And I just thought each chapter, the way you highlight essentially one particular critical person like Asa Philip Randolph or James Meredith was genius. And I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity, we're out of time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of make your final sort of, you know, statement to the, to the audience about your book uh, um, and about whatever else you want to talk about. Well, I don't think there's uh, much more to say. I just, you know, to me, the critical thing is here to get people to honestly think about where we are with race in America at this juncture. It's so difficult in this highly polarized political atmosphere um, for people to stop and see that there are major trends, major demographic trends occurring in the society, major economic shifts taking place in the society. Um, just in terms of immigrants, we are almost at a high in terms of the percentage of foreign-born people in the country at this moment and our relationship to a global economy and to populist impulses, again, that are global and that we've touched on here mm -hmm. with Professor Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to stop and then focus for a second on what is the original sin of American life, slavery, and its consequences then throughout our history, everything from civil war then to Jim Crow legal segregation to the modern civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, we come again now to another juncture where we are going to help to define ourselves in terms of who we are as an American people. And when President Trump is asking people, what the hell do you have to lose? We have to lose touch. We have to risk losing touch with ourselves and with our destiny, a positive destiny, uh, if we succumb to the kind of rhetoric that would divide us, it's almost exactly what the Russians had in mind when they were hacking into the 2016 election to play to the divisions in American society. And by the way, the Russians played directly to the racial tensions in the society in trying to boost Donald Trump and defeat Hillary Clinton. I think that should be a tell, if we're talking poker language here, that should be a tell for all of us that wow, the racial divisions are so powerful. Uh, some of us find it uncomfortable to talk about in public. We certainly don't like to have to use language, as you were describing, like racist. But at some point, we have to just be strong enough in our thinking, in our critical thinking, to come to terms with Trump and with what's going on in this society in terms of race. As I was being driven over here, the driver was saying to me, gosh, San Francisco has so many homeless people. It's just a scare. And then she started blaming this person and that person. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to Seattle uh, on my next stop on the book tour, and I think they have a worse problem <laughs> with the home. I said, in New York City, where I am all week, it's a terrible problem. In Washington, D.C., I think you have to start to see how the economy has left people behind, mm -hmm discourage some people who also, I think, are suffering from, in some cases, uh, illnesses and have been deinstitutionalized. These are all issues represented there. But I think the immediate kind of impulse is, oh, these homeless people you know, and disproportionately minority, oh, I can't stand. You stop and think, gosh, I wish this person would stop for just a second, think it through, understand the forces, and understand what she can do mm -hmm. in terms of helping to repair this gap in our society, this, this painful wound in our society. So to me, when you know, I wrote Eyes on the Prize, people would say to me, Juan, where did you get that title from? By the way, Eyes on the Prize is now, this is 30 years that that book's been in print. And it, you know, to me, amazing. But I often think when people say that to me, I, I, I have a, I, 30 years, I can just be honest with you, it's the most frequent question I get. It's not the first question I get about the book, but people always ask, where'd you get that title? And I tell them, if you go to church once in a while, <laughs> you'll discover that there's a hymn. Uh, and that in that hymn, there's a verse that goes, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on. I know the one thing I did right was the day I started to fight, hold on. Um, and for me, 
this is inspiring because it suggests that even as we all get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives or political shifts, the populist movement, left or right that you were talking about, the people who put their hands into the muck and mire of American life, the people who are trying to mold something positive, useful of our society are the people who make a difference, not people who simply get locked in to watching one cable channel or another or reading one bubble of conservative information or liberal information, but people who understand there is a larger historical picture to be taken in here and that you can help to paint that picture and make America better. Uh, thank you. To me, that's the point. Thank you. So we've reached the end of our program. Our thanks to Juan Williams, Fox News political analyst and author of the new book, What the Hell Do You Have to Lose? Trump's War on Civil Rights. We also thank everyone here, as well as our audience on radio, television, and the internet. And I want to apologize to anyone that submitted a question that I didn't get to. Uh, some of them I couldn't read, and others I just wasn't able to get to. I apologize if yours wasn't read. We I'm also, amazed that there were any. Uh, yeah, no, that no. to me like you right, asked them all. Right. A reminder <laughs> to everyone here that copies of Mr. Williams' new book are on sale, and he'll be pleased to sign them in this room following the program. I am Professor James Taylor, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, play, uh, Club the place where you're in the know is adjourned. <laughs> That's the most fun part. <laughs>